Welcome to the 25th anniversary edition of the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. We remind ourselves that we are running this festival as climate catastrophes multiply and intensify when over 6 million people worldwide have died from COVID, and when the people of Ukraine are fighting for democracy against the brutal Russian invasion and war. For all of us at FLEF, the world is our why. I am Stuart Ayash from the School of Health Sciences and Human Performance, and also on the programming team of the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. Major sponsors for FLEF include the Park Foundation, the Park Center for Independent Media, and Ithaca College. Our major festival partner is Cinemopolis, Ithaca's nonprofit arts cinema. Our festival theme this year is Entanglements a concept that explores how different environments, ideas, imaginaries, places, politics, practices, registers, and species twist into each other and enmesh. We're all very honored that you've joined us here today for this session, Entangled, Climate Crisis and Media. Please rename yourself with your physical location after your name. It is with great pleasure that I now introduce you to tonight's moderator, Raza Rumi, director of the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. Welcome uh, everyone, uh, good evening. And on behalf of uh, FLEF and Park Center for Independent Media, uh, I thank you all for signing up and attending this very important summit. Uh, our speakers tonight are really uh, outstanding uh, practitioners, researchers, and those who both produce and distribute knowledge. Uh, I will uh, introduce them uh, one by one later, uh, but I just want to say a few words about the Park Center for Independent Media, which is a center for the study of media outlets that create and distribute content outside traditional corporate systems. Uh, the center also examines how independent media can affect change on journalism, democracy, society, and participatory cultures. As our planet struggles to cope with the ongoing climate crises, we must ask how important it is to achieve an informed public opinion, which can drive climate action and build pressure on governments and powerful lobbies that continue to exploit non-renewable energy resources across the world. One important facet of the current crisis is communication. On one hand, the alarming results of climate research are not being conveyed by science and media. On the other, governments and special interests have deployed deliberate efforts to spread denialism. Coverage on last August's landmark report from the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change fell flat uh, with only 
13% of TV news shows mentioning its findings during their segments on extreme weather. This follows a trend in corporate news of obfuscating the cause and effect of environmental impacts. Mainstream journalism often ignores the connection between fossil fuels and worsening climate, climate effects too, as affirmed by the mere 16 minutes of broadcast TV coverage on the recent UN climate report, which again called for a drastic reduction of fossil fuel usage. To explore these themes, our summit tonight will engage with climate re researchers and, and journalists, and we shall try and unpack the entangled roots of this crisis and ask how we can address it to secure our, co our co collective futures and how to ensure we are better equipped to prepare for and adapt to climate change. Um, uh, the first uh, uh, theme of this summit that we are trying to address uh, has to do with the representations of climate crisis in mainstream media. And I would uh, start uh, with uh, Phil McKenna, who is a very well-known reporter from Inside Climate News, one of the premier uh, um, environmental uh, journalist outlets. And um, Phil, over to you. I mean, my 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 question or come comment uh, for you is that um, a review by Media Matters uh, recently found that the volume of climate coverage on corporate broadcast news has uh, waxed and waned over the past eleven years. And uh, how can um, why is this happening? And how can the news media make up for such tepid co uh, coverage? Uh, and have you noticed any improvement in wow. the recent years or the representation remains uh, the, uh, along the lines of uh, either denialism or misinforming the public? Thanks, Radha. Uh, that's a great question. And I, I saw that Media Matters report today as well. I was just really struck uh, by what happened this week in climate news. Uh, so on Monday, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's leading climate scientists came out with their most dire report yet that said, it's now or never. We don't have any more time. We don't have the 12 years we thought we had. We don't have 10 years. Within the next six years, we will completely blow our carbon budget. We will go beyond locking in 1.5, more than 1.5 degrees of warming. And we, we really can't be waiting anymore. Basically, the planet's on fire. And the media response was, was awful, uh, 16 minutes. That's combined across all the major networks. Fox News and MSNBC didn't even mention the report. It's sort of like a Hollywood movie where there is a meteor headed for planet Earth and there's a collective shrug. And at most, someone might say, you know, don't look up. Um, why is this? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm no media analyst. Uh, I'm a reporter. But I mean, a couple of things. Yeah, there's uh, ideological um, opposition to covering climate change at a place like Fox News. MSNBC, uh, they themselves have said that, you know, covering climate change, it just tanks their viewership. Uh, no one wants to hear it. What I do know and what I can tell you, um, inside climate news, we have, we started um, in 2007 and the thought was really to try to fill the void of this lack of climate coverage. At the time, major newspapers were closing their environment and their science desks and we jumped in to try to fill that void. We're now seeing newspapers returning to having really robust climate coverage, but at the same time, there's this really fractured media landscape uh, where there's also a lot of disinformation. Uh, there's often now paywalls to get the news. Um, and yeah, there's this fake news, whether it's climate, yeah. whether it's COVID, uh, whether it's the war in Ukraine, um, and how do you pierce that bubble? I don't have the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. But uh, uh, and and uh, thanks for uh, you know all the work that you and your colleagues at Inside Climate News uh, undertake because that is filling in the void left by the mainstream corporate media. 
Uh, I will go to our next uh, speaker at the summit, Maureen Nandini Mitra, who is the editor of Earth Island Journal. Uh, Maureen and her team won the Izzy Award as well two, two years ago, uh, which is given annually to uh, outlets and journalists who uh, achieve uh, outstanding work in independent media. Maureen, um, I'm going to ask you the same question and uh, about the representation. How far are we to blame the mainstream media and what can be done about it? Well, I mean, like Phil, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I think uh, we all know, you know, diversity matters. And if you bring in people from different sections, not just in terms of skin color and race, but also economic um, sectors uh, or economic backgrounds, uh, that helps change the perspective of what kind of stories get seen and heard. And in that context, um, I would really love to say one of my pet peeves in how we cover do journalism, be it environmental or others, is the whole parachute journalism thing where you, know, you send students, you send reporters out to a location and you don't make the effort of engaging a local reporter to tell that story. And if you did, then that person who's place-based, who has a deep knowledge of the place, would be able to inform that story better. And we see this happening across mainstream media. And, you know, um, so I think as journalists, we need to think about who is telling the story, who are you highlighting in that story, who are your main characters that you're bringing up. And that also always changes depending on who is doing the reporting, right? So I think if we want it to be more inclusive, if we want to have a broader perspective, that is really key. And that also starts a lot in journalism schools. For instance, you know, I go give, give talks at journalism schools and often there are students who are being sent out across the world to do a two week reporting project. And these are big prominent schools. It would be great if the students could focus more locally and you know, figure out how to report from there. So I think when we're talking about representation, it starts with us as um, you know, veteran journalists, as educational institutions, and as practicing young upcoming journalists thinking about that and about you know, who gets to tell the story and whose voice you're gonna lift up. And Thank that you. goes across the gender spectrum. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great uh, point you made. Uh, so I'll uh, move to Professor Jake Benner, who is the chair of uh, Environmental Sciences and Studies Department at, at, at Ithaca College and also a researcher of uh, great merit. Um, Jake, what do you make of the media representations? Well, I, would, I think I would first respond to uh, Phil's comment by acknowledging that it is actually difficult to find the news on climate. And I even find myself late in coming to the awareness that the IPCS released reports. Um, and and there's, something, there's definitely something wrong with that. So as an environmental scientist, deeply invested and deeply concerned about global climate change, um, I'm, I, it, 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 there's a delay, there's a lag in me uh, even, you know, hearing that major news is broken. So I think there's, I think there's very much something going on there. Um, and second, I would respond to Maureen, I guess, by saying that uh, the question of whose, whose voices are, are heard is, it's much more important than just the principle of the matter. There's a very important uh, practical effect of that, which I think Marina did a really nice job of, of bringing up, that um, climate stories that are told by voices who have local expertise and local authority and who have, um, you know, the, the trust and the audience all over the world are what to me, it seems it would take, irrespective of what big media outlets are saying. Yeah, great. Uh, our, our fourth speaker is Dr. Panita, once again from IC, and uh, she is also a professor at the Environmental Sciences and Studies uh, Department. Panita, your response and your comment on the coverage of uh, climate in the mainstream news? Uh, 
Thank you, Raz. I feel very fortunate because I get to respond to everyone. Uh, so just going off what Phil and Jake were talking about, uh, the representation in the media, it was really hard to find anything in mainstream media. I'm a reader. I go to New York Times or Washington Post. They just had two articles that is sort of distilling, not in a very fine job. The top article in BBC, even after the report was published by the IPCC, was about a lorry that overturned and spilled its biscuits. Uh, so that was what was going on. And so I was looking at Twitter for my news. And this is a big report. It's telling us essentially that coal needs to be phased out to keep the planet under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Methane emissions need to be reduced by a third. And yet there was complete silence. And coming to Maureen's point about whose voices are heard, that matters so much. And that shapes the debate, right? That shapes the discourse, that shapes the narrative, it shapes the problem. And then once you have a problem framing, only then you can think of solutions. So who in the world thought long, long, long ago that a polar bear is a symbol for us to rally around, around the environmental movement? Why not the lives and the experiences of people are experiencing these crises? Why not the water, the brown water with lead contamination? So that's... Um, that's my understanding of what is happening with the media today. And we need to sensationalize things. And maybe it's, uh, there's nothing to sensationalize in a report that is talking about the most important mitigation actions we need to take uh, for our survival. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, a great response. And, uh, you know, as Maureen mentioned, the, you know, whose voice is being uh, reflected or covered in the mainstream media. One of the key issues, and in fact, I take this, uh, uh, the, our next theme is about how race, gender, and the global South appear in the news media. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, one part of this has to do with Earth Island Journal's stellar work uh, on how they uh, reported uh, that women uh, scientists, uh, indigenous women, and and other uh, uh, you know communities of color were excluded from the reporting uh, and almost making them invisible. Um, once again, studies show that white men continue to receive the majority of airtime as guests in broadcast TV. Climate coverage as part of a trend neglected the outside impact of climate change on women, uh, you know, people of color, the poor, the marginalized. And that's my next uh, question, and, uh, and I told, uh, you know, for you all to talk about. And I'll start with you, Maureen. Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, I want to maybe suggest a solution to that is, you know, like, and I learned this from one of my former professors um, at Columbia, Sri Srinivasan. He does not accept an invitation to a panel if there aren't women on it or people from other gender identifications. And I think that is, you know, a really good way forward. So also in the same way, in the way as a journalist, if you're doing, if I'm doing reporting, I will try to search out sources that are not necessarily white male. It's not always possible because there are barriers to even women researchers participating in a, an interview. And these are barriers that have to do with their gender, with them being people, the, you know, the women tend to be the caregivers. They tend to be the ones who are thinking about what's for dinner and did the child do the homework and things like that because of the unequal distribution of the work, daily workload, women scientists, women researchers, even if they are doing cutting edge research and studies, they don't manage to make the time to actually talk to media. So it is on us to try to reach out and make you know, try to make them talk <laughs> often, you know. So this is something I have noticed in the work that I've done. So I want to take my time to actually highlight that. So that's, some, that's a way of maybe moving forward because we already know what the problem is. Right, right. Uh, I'll uh, jump uh, straight uh, on the issue of this, uh, uh, you know, inadequate representation or even, uh, you know, invisibility. And Pranita, I'm going to ask you about how, uh, you know, the movements, the research uh, that is being undertaken in the global south, you know, in Latin America, South Asia, Africa, how, that's how that never features, you know, when you read even uh, good reports in the media. Uh, they're so Eurocentric, if I may use that term, you know, so 
uh, I'll, I'll have a quick take on that one. Thank you, Raza. So uh, lots of things going on there, but to unpack it in a very short frame. Uh, so Reuters published a hot list last year, thousand climate activists and academics actually, and how influential they are based on the research they do, how many times they're cited, and how often it's picked up by media and public policy and social media. Only 111 were from the global south. Most of them from China, 88 from China. I think there were three from Africa and all three of them were based in South Africa. So a lot of that scientists is coming from, uh, the research is coming from the global north, which tends to get skewed toward the natural science, right? Which means there are gonna be models and figures and graphs and that's not accessible for people to read. This time with the IPCC report that came out for the first time, there was more number of women scientists ever there were indigenous peoples, there were activists who were included in the part of putting together the report. And for the first time in 30 years of the Global South saying that colonization is a root cause of the climate crisis, it was the first time in the report that the word colonization actually made it. It made it into the final report. It's not in the summary for policymakers, which is actually what matters because they use the summary for making their decisions. But this is how long it takes. And even if it's there, it's hidden away, which is not going to be really important, but that's still a big win that it's finally there and people have to confront that reality now. Right, right. Um, I, I'll actually uh, now go to Jake and Jake, uh, you heard uh, both Maureen and Panita and you know, this asymmetric knowledge production relationship, you know? So uh, I, I would like you to partly respond to that, but also maybe tell us how can the media and, and the journalists uh, and public communications pick up some of the uh, findings from the research uh, that is being done, you know, both in, in the global North and South, uh, because often, you know, it doesn't really, so that's one problem with with the big ticket climate change coverage is that you know often it it omits stories of people communities you know uh, how do we how do we improve the research frame as well? I, I'm glad to receive this question because it's 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 right at the top of my mind. Now okay. that doesn't make me an expert on this, but I know that I've had I. I, I had this conversation with Pranita about four hours ago in the hallway about how what is it about the production of scientific knowledge and the edifice of scientific expertise that gives us this very narrow view and includes a very narrow range of knowledge and experience? And uh, I think there's I think there's a lot going on. I think it's a really complex problem, and it has um, it, it has to do with the with the makeup of editorial boards at journals, it has to do with, uh, and I'm thinking, Maureen, about the, your comment about the panel composition. And I think that is, um, as, as at conferences, so it is in the print, um, you know, in the print sphere as well, at least as far as academic publishing goes, there are these legacy effects of um, it within academic publishing as well. And uh, I mean, this is anecdotal evidence here, but I read the tables of contents of a lot of journals and I see a lot of the same names and I see a lot of the same names reprinting stuff that I kind of feel like I read like five years ago. And it makes me feel like there's not a real genuine, or at least there's not a sufficient effort toward diversification, broadening, and, and I think it's not even just diversification, I think a better term is probably inclusion yeah. of a broad array of um, people that are entirely capable of producing, uh, you know, legitimate, it doesn't have to be science, but like legitimate expert knowledge when it comes to uh, things like climate change, which, as we know, are multidimensional, multi multidisciplinary, right? I mean, we have so many minted expert, highly credentialed typically white European and US American scientists that are producing this knowledge. And it's, it, it doesn't make a lot of space. Um, it doesn't make a lot of space for a whole bunch of other types of really important expertise. And I mean, expertise, I guess, technically is not what we call that, but I think maybe we could. Um, and uh, that would, you know, that would help. So I guess to speak for the academic side of things, um, some of the some of the institutions that we hold most dear, like peer review and um, 
and things like that wind up turning into um, exclusionary um, situations and exclusionary structures. That's a that's a great point, and I think that um, and that's what I'm trying to get at. Yes, Maureen, go ahead. I may add. I think it's part of it is just inertia and also just playing it safe, you know, um, and trying to reduce your workload. Often, you know, known faces kind of. So part of it is also trying to challenge yourself and reach out to people who you haven't ever worked with, whose work you're not familiar with. Um, in terms of scientific research, I did want to point out because I've talked mostly about gender stuff, but I did want to mention that, you know, there is an increasing acceptance um, these days, at least in the environmental movement and in the scientific movement, I would say, uh, um, of like traditional, what we are calling traditional ecological knowledge, right? Um, so we are hearing some of those voices. I think we need to maybe raise them up more. One really cool example that I wanted to cite was uh, just, I think it was two years ago where Australian scientists were like, oh yeah, there are these uh, birds of prey that actually start fires. And it was, it was literally something the Australia, Australian Aboriginal people had been saying forever. They call them the um, fire hawks, right? And they were a certain, certain raptor species that were actually, that actually take and burning sticks from fires and start fires elsewhere so that the animals can run out and they can hunt them. Um, so I'm just saying there are stories out there. There is research that has happened that can tap into this old knowledge that is happening. So it is in a way, I wanna highlight that there are these changes happening and there is some positive movement in that regard. So that, that gives me hope. Yeah, that's, that's a great point once again. So Phil, uh, Inside Climate News, I know tries to be very inclusive and has covered a lot. But do you think, I mean, have you seen a shift uh, overall in the coverage where it is more inclusive uh, of, of, of the excluded communities and genders? Absolutely. And this is a fascinating conversation. We just got back from just today from our annual three-day retreat where so much of this colonization, global self uh, was front and center in our discussions. Uh, we had an assigned book reading, Nutmeg's Curse, uh, that touched on all of this and tied it to directly to climate change and energy today. Um, and one of the things that was pointed out, you know, is, is this lack of diversity in media is as old as our country from, from day one. And going back even just, just 50 years, um, back in the 1960s, President Johnson um, was trying to figure out in the late 60s, you know, why are, why are we having so much trouble with urban riots every summer? And he commissioned a report, uh, the Kerner Report, and one of its key findings pointed its finger directly at the media and said, you are doing a horrible job shockingly backward coverage of Black America. And the things, some of the things you need to do are hire, train, and promote Black journalists. And that was in 1968. And I don't think things have changed very much, hardly at all in that time. Um, though in the last couple of years, following George Floyd, I think we're, we're starting to slowly see that, um, but I think we still have a lot of work to go. Uh, I would say too, with uh, talking about the global self, I mean, one thing I found in my reporting is you, you don't have to leave um, this country to find many of the sacrifice zones that you do see in the global self. Uh, a story I did last year on the Ponca tribe of uh, Oklahoma, it's just uh, a textbook example of a sacrifice zone, uh, air pollution, water pollution, and stealing of their mineral rights. What I did see that was really encouraging is there are solutions coming from communities like the Ponca tribe uh, where they are pursuing a very novel, at least novel in the US legal framework, the rights of nature uh, to fight back and try to regain some control over uh, their land. And we're also seeing that um, in Brazil where people are trying to bring President Bolsonaro to justice uh, for, um, for ecocide and try him in the International Criminal Court uh, for ecocide, a crime right alongside uh, geno genocide and other uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, so yeah, I, 
I guess this is very much front and center in what we are looking at and trying to figure out how we can do a better job internally as a news organization to cover. Thank you. Yeah, Raza. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add, like we've been talking about solutions, uh, but also I wanted to take a step back and remind everyone why this diversity and inclusion matters, given that all of the research activism happens and is always highlighted uh, in the media. It happens from the global north, right? And here there's this tendency to focus on science and techno-scientific solutions, like as Matt Damon says in The Martian, right? like let's science the hell out of this. Uh, Greta Thunberg, she's this young white girl, excellent activist, very inspiring. She also says the same thing, you know, we need to listen to the science and the scientists. But what that happens is that people in the global south, um, activists in the global south for long have been talking about that solutions, yes, science, yes, but it's about these land rights. It's about securing land tenure for people who are defenders of their forests. But then someone like John Kerry comes into the scene, climate czar of the US, and he says something like 50% of the emissions are going to come from, 50% of the reductions in emissions are going to come from technologies that have yet to be invented. What does that even mean? Uh, and this is like, and a lot of support came out for John Kerry, for people like Columbia, like Steve Cohen, all of them writing in support of, uh, and that is what gets most of the media coverage. And but it's different, right? It's not the, like, these are fairy tales and fantasies that are being cooked up by people in the global north, and that's not gonna help us get out of the climate crisis. That's a, that, that's a very valid point. I'm glad you raised this because I was about to say this. Anyway, we move on to our next theme, and that has to do with the utter denialism that we uh, also see in, in, in some of the most influential uh, sections of uh, media here in the US, but also outside the US, you know, uh, this, uh, and, and this has played a huge role in holding back uh, the public uh, responses to the emergency that we face, you know, right wing media outlets, including Fox News, and especially anchor Tucker Carlson, have aggressively downplayed the crisis, espousing denialism meant to prevent efforts to address it. And we know that leaders such as Donald Trump and Bolsonaro was mentioned earlier, and many others as well, have, have been denying the effects of global warming and rolled back uh, the re responsive measures. Now, obviously, part of it has to do with how the uh, capitalist structure works, how the corporate ownership of media occurs, how special interests and lobbies play. But I think part of it also has to do with the knowledge. Once again, the gap between knowledge and uh, and its communication and the public. I mean, and I think that's something we, I would really like you all to unpack, you know. So perhaps we'll start with you, Maureen, on the unpacking of denialism, uh, because Jake ended uh, earlier, so I'll, I'll go to Jake later uh, and, and to Phil. Uh, but I mean, what do we do uh, about this? I mean, you know, how, how can the media fraternity and, uh, you know, confront this brazen, uh, you know, set of lies, if I may call it that? That, I don't know. I think whoever <laughs> figures that out is, needs an award. I do not really know the answer. I struggle with it all the time. My father-in-law, who's a physicist, keeps asking me, well, which news organization should I trust? You know, because he, he is confused, okay, you know, we are in a very strange time when it comes to information and it has become so much of a burden on the consumer of news or the reader to figure out what is real and what is not. Um, and there has been, I would say in many ways, a kind of breakdown of trust between the public and journalists. Uh, how we surmount that, I. I kind of feel that for a long time, journalists have, you know, have been, you know, seen as sort of lofty, not so much maybe, I haven't noticed that as much in the US as I've noticed when I was a journalist in India. But, you know, you're kind of considered these gatekeepers of information and knowledge. I think if we put ourselves forward as more real and, you know, and also reveal that we are grappling with the information that we get and trying to understand it in the way we place it instead of saying this is right you know taking that ground of always knowing what we are saying 
that might be a possible way forward. Um, but honestly, I, if you, any of you on the panel have a better answer, <laughs> I would lob that ball over to you. Well, well, I think I think let's let's move to uh, Phil <laughs> because he seems to have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. I mean, yeah, I am no media critic. I don't know those who are media critics, and they they look at Fox News. They say, well, you know, some are saying this is a partisan news outlet that kind of a mouthpiece for the GOP or, or straight out propaganda for the GOP, uh, and this is a party, a political party that gets a lot of its funding from fossil fuel interests. And their platform is, yeah, to deny, deny, deny climate change. What I think is interesting is the goalposts on climate denial are continuously moving. Uh, you don't hear so much anymore, though you do still hear it some that climate change is just a straight out hoax. Uh, what you hear, particularly from energy companies, is that you know, we believe in climate change and we're working to address it, but energy security is such an important issue. And we have to ensure, especially people in developing countries that they have access to energy. And therefore, even though uh, renewables are, are much cheaper, quicker to install, uh, we're gonna have to lock into fossil fuels for decades to come. So you're seeing this, this moving of the goalposts and, and it's often hard to, to keep up with, uh, but, it's it's straight up denialism, whether it's calling it a hoax or saying, you know, we, we can't do it now, uh, we'll address it later. Uh, and you see that even here in the US where there's increasingly uh, opposition to large scale renewable energy going in, whether it's uh, solar or wind, you're increasingly uh, hearing false claims about the, the negative, potential negative health impacts, uh, whether it's the flicker, shade flicker from large windmills, uh, or even I heard this week, um, uh, false claims of if you live next to a large solar installation, uh, there could be lead uh, leaking into the groundwater surrounding it. So you, you don't want, uh, you don't want um, solar anywhere near you. Uh, so it's just really hard to keep track of this, this moving goalpost um carbon footprint don't even get me started there <laughs> um, yeah. I, I i do want to add in Phil, i do want to say you know we are calling out fox news but let us be clear that a lot of mainstream media is also underwritten by big oil money big plastic money big corporation money and that influences there is no doubt that influences what kind of reporting is published so you know the big solution is you got to get big money, <laughs> big corporate money out of journalism. Um, you know, how would we yes. fund journalism then becomes the question that we need to address. That That's absolutely critical. You know, thank you, Maureen, for bringing that up. And before I go to Jake and Paranita, I, I do want to, uh, you know, uh, Chomsky's, uh, Noam Chomsky's interview, latest interviews was published at this morning. And in which I just want to quote this one line uh, where, and I quote his words that because of Trump's fanaticism, the worshipful base of the Republican Party barely regards climate change as a serious problem. That's a death warrant to the species. Unquote. So I, I just wanted to highlight that quote. Uh, but uh, Jake, I'll come to you on, on this one. How do you see as a climate scientist, as someone who produces all this work and who's invested in this issue, when you hear things on Fox News or other outlets and all the social media disinformation that is so rampant in the US, uh, uh, what's your response to it, and where where do you think are the gaps? I mean, Maureen has highlighted one uh, one very important issue, and that is of big corporate money in journalism and corporate ownership of large, you know, media oligarchies. But other than that, do you think that the scientific knowledge is also, uh, you know, uh, being transmitted effectively? And that's the, and that's also where academics are often under spotlight whether they're doing a, you know, the, the right accessible sort of uh, uh, job, um, your thoughts? It's, it's a good, it's a really good question, Raza. I, I, have, to, I have to go back to some of seed that Phil planted though. And I think, uh, thank you, Maureen, for your response to that. Um, it, 
it, it's, I think it's really important to see climate denialism not as just something that Tucker Carlson and the Fox media conglomerate participate in, but something that many outlets and to some degree, most of us are participating or in or complicit in to some degree. So there are many different flavors of climate denialism. And I think to dichotomize it as like denialists versus the rest of us normal people, I think is destructive. And uh, uh, I, I think what's, I often think about systemic racism as being more than what you see in like To Kill a Mockingbird. It's actually the stuff that's sort of everywhere throughout society and unacknowledged. And that's the kind of climate denialism that I worry most about. It's not, it's not Tucker Carlson so much as all those other people that are like, eh, not yet, just can't really quite afford it. Um, that's the sort of thing that makes me worry. When I, and first of all, like the, I, my, my mind was boggled by the period of 2016 to 2020 when all of what I took to be like empirically founded reality just sort of got like exploded or turned upside down. So I don't know what to do about like avowed denialism. I mean, to take a, to take the basic fact that the sun, you know, seems to rise in this part of the, you know, sky and then say, no, it doesn't actually, it rises over there. And then to marshal millions of followers that are willing to believe you on that, it's just sort of, I, I don't know what to do with that. But it reminds me of something that I learned uh, back in graduate school, which is that no matter what we do environmentally, it's political. Yeah. It's political and nothing we, nothing, no amount of publications that we, uh, or, or data we bring to the conversation is going to change people's minds if it's political. And I'm thinking of this, you know, field that I like called political ecology, which is the sort of socialization, not socialization really, but it's the, uh, it's a conjuncture of the integration of social, of the human with environmental science, okay? And it's the acknowledgement that there's no such thing as an apolitical ecology. If, when we talk about environmental science, it's a political thing. And um, I think until we acknowledge that, we can't really get anywhere because we're always going to be confronting people who are just like, well, I don't believe you. And what, there's not much you can do with that. So I think just the very first step is to say, like someone said earlier, and I, I, I've lost track of who it was, like, like we're human journalists, I think, right? Jour journalists are human and that's like, okay. And we're all kind of just trying to swim through this together. And a little bit of humanity, a little bit of humility, I think can really help break down some of those barriers to communicating the messages that we have to communicate. You know, I'm, I'm an environmental scientist. That doesn't make me an expert in everything. I'm not trying to be an authority on stuff. I'm just really curious. And I'm curious, like you're curious. And, you know, maybe there's some, maybe we have something in common in the curiosity. Um, I don't know, maybe that's the way forward. I, 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 when I talk to my students about that, there's a very powerful divide. There's a very powerful, you know, thing between faculty and students. And the more that I can admit to the students that I'm learning stuff too, yeah. the farther we get together. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pranita. Uh, your turn <laughs> on this very complex, <laughs> because as we're talking about, I mean, it's becoming more and more complicated anyway. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Raza. Uh, I feel like Jake just took the words out of my mouth when I was going to say that it's all about the politics and it's so political. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about climate denialism in India, how, how different it is from what happens in the US. Mm. In India, there's no such climate denialism as such. We don't have left and right with regard to at least the climate. But India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he's a master of seeding confusion about climate change. In 2014, this is like to a broad audience of school children, he said something like, the climate has not changed and we have changed. And then he went on this whimsical tangent of threading a needle in the moonlight or something. I don't know what he was trying to say. But on the international arena, Modi and his ministers really step up for the climate equity and the climate justice argument, which is, OK, you all are doing that. Fair enough. But at the same time, at home, they're still hiding behind India's poor, right? Uh, that we need energy development and we have so many billions of people in poverty. But then now Modi's agenda has also gone toward this uh, the re the reemergence of this Hindutva project, where 
a good Hindu will also have this low emission lifestyle where you're a vegetarian uh, and he'll talk about the Rig Veda and bring in the elements of air, water, solar, uh, and making yoga as a way to address problems. And what this does is it consolidates India's far right behind Modi, so much so that it suppresses all of the class and caste uh, conflicts that is there. It fans Hindu-Muslim divisions uh, because now it says that, look, look at these Muslims. They are meat-eating Muslims and they are not going to help us in the fight to climate crisis. And they're all, they'll also talk about the high population rates among the Muslims. And he gets voted into power over and over again with this kind of climate discourse at the background. Uh, so there's no denialism as such, but it's for the remaking of this grander Hindutva nation state. Right, yeah. And this is even more insidious and complicated to deal with. But anyway, in the interest of time, let's just move on to our uh, next theme, which is about natural and other di disasters. And I'll start with Jake on that one and uh, quickly uh, get your take and then Phil. And then if Maureen and Pranita, you have something to respond, uh, please say so. So Jake, over to you. Um, thank you, Raza. On this topic, I'm going to actually keep it kind of brief. Um, the science suggests that what we call disasters, which in the first place are at least half socially produced, as they are biophysically produced, um, are going to increase in frequency and they're going to increase in severity. And I think we see it in fire, we see it in floods, we see it in um, hurricanes are a fine example where we're going to see more of them and they're going to be more severe. And the trouble or the, it's not trouble, it's just basic scientific uncertainty. It's a fact of the matter. It's a fact of doing that kind of work and taking that approach. Uh, the difficulty is in attribution and yeah. it's in assigning cause in global climate change to these events that we can readily observe. And so that's, that, that, I think that's the gap. The scientists are being honest about the uncertainty. The public is, is, is very aware of what's actually going on. And yet there's a gap between those two. And I think that's where the political bit gets in the way. Yeah, so it's politics uh, at the end of the day. Phil, I'll uh, come to you about these abnormal weather patterns, about socially and politically produced uh, disasters and the media. Yeah, I mean, I think Jake hit it right on the head in that, you know, the science does tell us there, there's going to be more intense and more frequent um, hurricanes, floods, fires, uh, intense heat. Uh, but it's often difficult to say, well, this particular event was a direct cause of climate change. Though that's changing with hurricanes. There's now often rapid attribution studies that within a few days can say this event was X percent more likely because of climate change. But I think the real breakdown, at least as I see it in the media, is rarely in a story about the current hot spell that's hitting whatever city, is rarely is that link ever made to, yeah, and climate science tell us that climate scientists tell us that this is likely to happen and it's now happening more frequently, more intensely because of climate change. And I mean, yeah, back to MSNBC again, it was Chris Hayes, one of the, one of the hosts said, you know, talking about this climate stuff is, is just a ratings killer. Um, people don't want to hear it. And we as corporate media are really chasing those ratings. We're responsible to our shareholders. They've got to keep the ratings up. Uh, so let's not talk about this climate stuff because people don't want to hear it. Uh, and I think that gets back to uh, kind of, yeah, the corporate media is chasing those ratings, is responsible to corporate shareholders. Uh, it used to be that they were a public service, uh, that news media was a public service for the public. And I think we've got to find a way back to that. Right, right. Thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, I'll, um, I think let's move on to the Ukraine and Russia uh, issue. And then uh, Panita and Maureen, if there's something on disasters, I'm sure it'll come up in Q&A. And I'll, uh, I'll request you to then address it if that's okay. So Russian invasion of Ukraine, the brutal unfolding of a tragedy that we are witnessing, uh, I mean, every minute. So, um, you know, 
it is also a struggle over natural resources. It has, uh, it is directly sort of linked in a way to climate change. I would like your very quick uh, take on that, all four of you, and maybe I can start with you, Phil, if that's okay. Sure, war is an ecological catastrophe, full stop. Uh, and we, if we're looking at it from the environmental lens, we want to avoid war at all costs, particularly in this case in Ukraine, where Russia's playing games with Ukraine's nuclear power plants. Um, what I would say, what struck me about the war in Ukraine is that at least for those in the US, it is, it's this Rorschach test for you've had this very intense disruption of the energy supply in Europe. Where do we go forward from here? Uh, and you have some saying we need to embrace natural gas. We need to just start fracking drill, baby drill and exporting LNG to Europe. That's going to um, bring us security in Europe. And others are saying, no, I mean, one, um, that's not going to happen quickly overnight. And two, it, it's going to get us in more trouble with climate change. And the answer, what we need to do is what the city of Ithaca is now doing, requiring everyone to switch to heat pumps, high efficiency electric heating, uh, and that there should be a defense production act um, to rapidly mobilize millions of heat pumps uh, for Europe, for the US as well, to get us off of natural gas. I think it's a real turning point for our energy future, and it'll be interesting to see where we go. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, can I go to... Uh, I, I want to say something in context of those heat, going, heat bumps. Yeah. There is a huge bottleneck there, and that is the workforce, because we don't actually have enough trained workforce to help transition. You know, there are people who want to install heat pumps today, and they can't find enough electricians who have the expertise to do that, who have the time to do that. So there is an opportunity here too, and, but there is that need for the training. So when we say we need to that, make that transition quickly, we need to think about beyond like the movement where the workforce is and how we can retrain them. Just wanted to add that one in. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, may, maybe Jake, can I ask you to weigh in on this point? Uh, your quick uh, uh, take on, on this issue? I, I think I, I would echo what Phil says, that war is bad for the environment. Period. Um, what strikes me about the conflict, about the in Russian invasion of Ukraine, is just how popular it's become. I mean, it's really amazing how much coverage there is of this. Like today, I just heard, um, in, in spite of it all, I heard that there was a ceasefire in Yemen, and yet the world kind of forgot about that crisis and a bunch of others, a bunch of other wars and conflicts as well. And so I think that's really important. I think, you know, that be, that being as how it is, I think that we, we've got to somehow take advantage of the world's attention on this to make something good happen. Correct, correct. Well, that's a great point. Parnita. Yeah, thank you, Raza. And um, so just what Phil and Jake mentioned that war is so bad for the ecology, like just the environment and just made me think about what do we even mean by war? Uh, like there have, and yesterday on NPR, there was a discussion on genocide and it was this very academic privilege dis discussion about what does genocide mean? What's the definition? What's a war crime uh, based on what's happening in Ukraine? And that just made me think about, but having, so yes, there is this war full-fledged, it's happening in front of our eyes. Everyone is following it 24 seven and it's getting all of this media coverage. Lives are being devastated, uprooted. Uh, there have also been slow wars happening usually for mining, for getting indigenous peoples out of an area to create a national park, for putting in nuclear power plants. There's a slow war happening for lithium. Like just look up any New York Times article. They'll always talk about lithium and they'll frame it in the way of like, oh, this is a race against China. This is a race that the US has to win because China is also on this race. So I think we also need to think about what are those slow wars that are happening that we never they don't get represented at all because it's not sensational. It's not going to grip people because they happen so slowly. So for a group of people who've always faced these kinds of events, the apocalypse has already happened and it's just going to keep happening over and over again. And now we are seeing this apocalypse for the first time play out in front of the whole world. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. 
Okay, thank you, Pranita. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so I guess we should move to the Q&A. And uh, I'm sorry, Maureen, we'll come to you definitely. I'll okay. have many questions for you. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, as our uh, uh, great uh, producer Annie has been mentioning in the chat uh, that if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, your, your question, keep it brief. Um, or if you want to respond, but uh, the shorter it is, the more questions and participation we'll have. So, okay, Stuart, that's great, please. Uh, you muted, Stuart, can you? I'll fix your I'm happy to do that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for an enlightening and really provocative uh, series of conversation, uh, serious conversation about this topic. Uh, I just want to make two points. I'll be as quick as possible. First of all, it's not just the right wing media. The New York Times, the Washington Post had these little namby pamby headlines about we can still save things. In fact, I have them right here. New York Times says stopping climate change is doable. The Washington Post says six steps we can do to take the whole climate change. This, that's, no, that's not what was in the report that was the headline. They picked these things that really were something that people can do rather than the really chaos that it occurs. What we need, and, and this is a communication issue, it's not just a scientific issue, as you all mentioned, we need a doomsday clock for climate. We need a dashboard for climate that we can look at almost every day, like we look at for COVID, at least some of us do, like can, like, like nerds like me. Um, who's the speaker for climate change? Greta Thunberg is really terrific, but we don't have anybody that is charismatic who can be a leader. We need a Winston Churchill for the climate. And I don't know who that would be, but um, when I was um, living in, in Singapore during the first SARS pandemic, uh, they devoted an entire TV station just to SARS. We need a TV station that addresses climate change all the time. It's got to be front and center in a way that people can't deny it. And I'll leave it at there because everybody else might have some things to say about that too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. Nambi Bambi is my phrase of the day. <laughs> so uh, anyway, who, who wants to start? I mean, any volunteers or, or shall we just arbitrarily assign? <laughs> uh, okay, well, Jake, how I do love you- the idea of a TV station for climate. I think that, yeah. and that may just be what it takes. Yeah, Phil? Um, I would love to see that TV station. I would watch the hell out of it. I fear others may not. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Maureen? Uh... Sorry, um, I missed that one. So I'm going to yeah. look. Yeah, that's okay. It's, it's about opening a TV station. It's about how it, not just the conservative media, but also the so-called liberal media. And that's the problem here. Even they have these Nambi Pambi headlines uh, to, to quote. Uh, yes, Pranita. Solutions-oriented kind of headlines, is that? <laughs> well, perhaps, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I think it's a challenge. I think people shy away from anything that sounds, I guess, new agey. It only appeals to a certain section. Um, but I, I, I really think it's, it's about, for me, I feel a lot of what speaks to me when I read is when people put themselves, um, you know, I see a little bit of the person in the writing and in, I, the headline can be whatever, but if I can get that in the first few lines, that would help. And same thing with the reporting. If, if, if we do have a channel that tries to do that, I, I would listen. But okay. I'm more of a reading person. Pranita. So I was just going to say uh, a news station that's not funded by the corporate. Yes. Uh, but also yeah. just thinking about this and also who, who is hired, right, eventually in these news stations. And again, that's going to shape what debates and discourses happen. But just uh, responding again to one part, what Stuart said about we have this Greta person, very inspiring. Yes. And we do have actually charismatic people, but they just don't get the media coverage. The British Pakistani activist Asad Rehman keeps talking about this, that solutions are not going to come from a battery. It's going to come with justice and reparations and equity. Why isn't that a big deal yet? Like it's just buried somewhere. And people have been saying this over and over again. 
Uh, so I saying like saying that you know we don't have uh, more charismatic people is actually shortchanging the people who are charismatic and have been doing a hell lot of work in uh, addressing the climate crisis. Thank you, Parpalita. I think you and Jake are obvious choices uh, to work at that TV station. So so please uh, keep your moonlighting job <laughs> in, no, in mind. Pranita's point is really important. Um, it's 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 not that those charismatic leaders don't exist, it's that they're not being heard. And um, they, uh, yeah, and, and I, I'll leave it at that. I think that's, yeah. I think that's critical. Yes, I and think. I go to Ian Skekner, who is our, our very dear PCIM uh, friend and colleague. Yes, Ian, your question or comment? Well, hi, in line with what uh, Stuart was asking and what, uh, what Jake was saying, um, my question is, is there a, there's all this discussion about mainstream media and the challenges of it and how we are trying to be active and shift it and get better coverage there, but particularly in light of the recent report, yet another reminder that this clock is ticking and it is real now. Is there a point where we should just give up on our efforts related to mainstream media. And the reason I'm asking is this, if we have a limited timeline, do we not have to ask some uncomfortably honest questions about how we use our limited time, our limited activism, our limited resources? There's so much energy into trying to shift, at least in the US, mainstream media to budge a little bit here, just a little bit more, a little bit better representation, and I'm asking this because what we just saw is that if we don't ensure proper education, if we don't ensure that inside climate news and legitimate independent outlets uh, exist and are sufficiently large enough, even when real science, even when the facts are shared on mainstream outlets, it is not enough. Even the people who support us and believe science they do not weigh it properly. They do not take the action. So what I'm really asking is, when we look at the return on investment from all the effort to try to shift mainstream media, are we at the point where we have to say, it's not going to work fast enough. We need to direct all of that energy to shifting education, to building up independent outlets, to making that the focus. Would that be a better use of our limited time and energy? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I think I would ask Phil to maybe respond to the, uh, the media part and then I'll ask Jake and Papanita to talk about education. Yeah. That's a great question, Ian. Uh, and I guess I would even take it one step further. Uh, my colleague Bob Berwin wrote a piece on this IPCC report where he quotes some of the scientists, not talking about the media, talking about politics and government. We need to go further. The Dems are no better on climate, proving to be no better on climate than the Republicans. We don't need a new political party. We need a revolution. Whether he's right or not, that's not for me to say. But yeah, I mean, with the clock ticking like it is, it's becoming increasingly dire and something needs to be done. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Jake, uh, some uh, your, uh, um, your views on the question, uh, the, the second part of the question about education, uh, how important it is. There are days when I feel like I should quit everything else I do and, and just take the streets. <laughs> really, if you're thinking of like how best to spend limited time, energy and resources, maybe it's that, but I struggle with that. Yeah, Pranita. Uh, once upon a time, I wanted to become an activist, and I think I channel all my activism into teaching today. But Jake and I were having this conversation, and we've been talking about this for a long time, like what should be the goal of education? And at least I think of it like we want to empower the young people who walk through our classrooms, who pass through our classrooms, but then how do we do that? Because it's easy also for us to talk about the doom and gloom scenario, and then students end up feeling hopeless. But there's also this discourse of the individualization of responsibility in the US, right? That we are the ones responsible. Like everyone thinks you're gonna recycle our ways out of the climate crisis. Uh, and we feel guilty and then we feel overwhelmed. And students keep saying this over and over again that we feel powerless. Uh, what do we do? We are just this one person. How are we going to confront this huge corporation and the policymakers and the government moves so slowly? 
And for a long time, I also thought that, well, the government is set up in a certain way, but it maintains the status quo, right? It doesn't allow for that shift to happen. So I totally agree with Phil that we need a revolution and we really need to interrogate those political and institutional structures that don't allow for change to happen. Uh, because if we want to have a revolution, that is what we need to focus on. The institutions need to change, but these institutions are so set in stone. It's long lasting and it's hard. No one wants to change institutions, right? You don't want to give up power and privilege. You feel threatened. And that's what the problem with the climate crisis is about. And that's why we see the nexus between the corporations and these powerful policymakers and the lobbyists. In the end, I always tell my students, follow the money. Uh, and that gives you a huge answer about, say, what's happening happening in Flint, Michigan, and that's connected to also the Nestle water bottling plant company that's just two hours away from Flint, Michigan, that apparently made more than, I don't know, $11 billion or something uh, during the Flint, Michigan crisis. So, Thank you. Thank you, Pranita. Uh, we have Smriti yeah, from uh, Jeb E. Brooks uh, School of Public Policy at Cornell. She is a master's student. Yes, Smriti, your question? Yes. Hello, sir. Um, what I wanted to, uh, what my reflection was from this panel of discussion was that climate change is, is effect is something that people generally relate to that something uh, that affects them closely. Even if climate disasters affect them, it's mostly the marginalized section of people who generally are affected, but they generally accept this as their fate, just like the poverty or disease. It's they accept it as it's in their fate that they have to face this, this disaster. But people who can shape the narrative or who have voices or who they get hurt, their heads are dig into the heap of luxury that abounds them. So I agree with Pranita, uh, just she said that uh, we have to change the mascot or the symbol of climate change. Like the who cares for the polar bear in global south if we don't care for the street dogs or put this lie around them. So we have to localize the symbols for the climate change. I think that's going to help that, which shows that people are generally, it's you that, who are affected by it. And also there's a gap. Uh, I think that um, there's a mismatch of like in Global South who, uh, where the people are nearly closely affected by these, they don't have voices. While in West they have voices and they have resources. There's, there's a mismatch of resource and the ideas that people, and it's not that gen, uh, Global South yeah. or Indian people or Pakistan people have uh, ideas. It's just that they are affected more closely. So they know they have a first-hand experience of it. Agreed, and also agreed. I think that uh, there are some... The that's just two one questions point, already. <laughs> <laughs> just one last point. Just like okay. that okay. in India, just I'm uh, from India, so I can talk from uh, their points of view that we have some traditional uh, water harvesting methods of light, which gets often sidelined because it doesn't, it's something that dismissed as primitive or traditional or outdated. While these are the localized measures that have helped uh, for years. So that was my point. <laughs> Thank right, you. right. Uh, thank you, Smithy. I will ask um, Maureen uh, to weigh yeah. in on these questions, you know, from and your you, report. I wanted to say there's actually a new book coming out called Water Always Wins that actually focuses on these traditional water harvesting structures and ideas across the world, including from Chennai. So um, there is, there is, I think, increasing understanding now that we can, there, there is a lot we can learn from the past and how people survived in difficult terrains in, you know, for centuries in places with harsh weather conditions. So that is, that is kind of bubbling up. Um, but yes, I think we do need to, in, we do need to uh, sort of tailor our messaging around these issues uh, in ways that people can understand in how it impacts their everyday lives. So yes. when we are talking about, uh, say, New Delhi and climate, we, we, we probably want to talk about the, the, the air quality and the water, how the groundwater is depleting. And that's, you know, the access to water issues and how that impacts your everyday life. So that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. I, I know all of the panelists have a lot to say, uh, but I will move to Maura Stephens, who is our former colleague. She's a climate activist and a journalist. Hi, Maura. Uh, your question. Hi, uh, it's two parts really. It's for the journalists and the scientists, but I wanted to point out that this week is Scientist Rebellion Week around the world. And scientists are deciding that perhaps their work should go, as Jake mentioned,
beyond the classroom, the lab and the field and take to the streets. And you have the opportunity to do that right now because it is a global phenomenon where scientists realize that they, they can publish mountains and mountains of research. They've already published mountains and mountains of research that show without a doubt what we have to do as a species if we're going to survive with any le level of comfort and let alone all the millions of other species that we are affecting by our actions. Mm. So these scientists are saying, okay, it's time. And I posted in the chat a link to the site where you can sign on to the document, the letter that has been signed on by um, many uh, scientists around the world and take action yourself and get your uh, fellow scientists and your colleagues to do the same. I'm a citizen scientist. I'm not, I don't have a PhD in sciences, but I've been studying sciences for a couple of decades now as a journalist. Um, I'm an environmental journalist among other types of journalism. Um, and I consider myself a jacktivist, a journalist activist, which is uh, frowned upon by many people in my profession. Um, and I wanted to pose to all four of you, but especially to Maureen, because I think Maureen and I might have had this conversation some years ago at a free press conference ourselves. Um, I'm mocked and, and kicked out of, of uh, meetings and conversations because I admit upfront that I'm a journalist activist, but I believe that I do not do my job properly if I'm not activating for people and planet in all of my work. Thank you, Maura. People and planet. So my question is for all of you, how do you feel on these scientific scientist activist and journalism activist questions thanks thank you maura we'll uh, we'll uh, get your question addressed and we love jacktivists so don't worry me and you're more than welcome in all our meetings so uh, anyway i start uh, with all of you all four panelists maybe you can start with uh, responding to maura and then wrap it up as well as you concluding remarks I mean, I mean i'm really enjoying it but i see we have an audience and everyone and uh, we want to uh, adhere to the time uh, limits as well so over to you maybe phil you can start with your wrap up comments you can address what maura also said Said about uh, uh, jacktivists, if I may say, journalists who are activists too, or vice versa. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a very real thing, and I think you're seeing more of it both within journalism and within the scientific community. And I think Jake and Pranita are expressing a, some of those similar feelings. So I sh maybe I should just go out into the street. And you're seeing it too in some IPCC scientists who are saying, you know, what's the point? No one's listening to these reports. Why, why am I wasting my time? Uh, I, I don't know what the solution is, but uh, it's, coming, it's coming to be crunch time and something needs to change. Yes, thank you, Phil, thank you. Uh, Maureen. Um, well, you know, I do not make any bones about not being an objective journalist. Uh, I'm an environmental journalist. My job is, and I believe that if I need to speak out in defense of the earth, I'm gonna do that. Um, and uh, honestly, I don't believe there is anything called objective journalism. You cannot do it because you're, you're, how you think and what your background is and how you are informed about the world informs what you write. So to say that we are fair and balanced is, uh, is, kind, of a is kind of misleading. What you can say is I'm gonna to try to tell the truth to the best of my ability and my understanding. And I would say there are increasing number of journalists who are realizing that there are increasing number of scientists. We know Catherine Hayhoe, who is like a very well-known climate scientist who is an activist. I could call out uh, Lori Marino, who's an animal rights activist and an animal cognitive scientist. So, so when Phil, you're saying something that needs to shift, it is already shifting, but it needs to shift a lot more. And I think, you know, we should not be shy of like, putting our values out there and fighting for it. Thank you, uh, Maureen. And, and any closing thought you have, uh, please feel free to add it now so that we can just uh, wrap it okay. up. I yes? think that, that's what I want to say. I, I, you should not hesitate to speak out. If, you, if you're a journalist, exactly. it's about time. If you're a scientist, it's about time. You know, we, we're running out. So Maura, I'm with you there. And we go to our scientists now, scientists come activists in Pranita's case. So Jake, uh, I start with you. 
I think uh, I think it's time for less research and more teaching and better teaching, teaching to empower people to make yeah. something happen. Absolutely, but how well put, uh, Pranita. Uh, thank you, Raza. I think uh, there are different ways to be an activist. Uh, you don't always have to be out on the streets, but you can also be activist in the classroom. You can be activist in your research and you can shape, uh, we get to shape the minds of students. Like what could be, you know, greater activism than that? Like students, I, I, like I'm still a junior instructor and sometimes it just amazes me that students want to just jot down things that come out of my mouth, which half the times I don't even understand what I am saying. And I find that to be a huge position of power and responsibility. Uh, so I think that's one way that I can continue being an activist. Uh, and I hope I can continue doing that for the rest of my career and my life. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you, Pranita. Education, information, communication, bridging these gaps, activism. There's so many points that I'm taking away. I'm sure the audience is also taking away. I thank you all once again, Phil, Maureen, Pranita, and Jake, uh, uh, who has been really a uh, key to um, designing this event. And uh, uh, we wouldn't be holding this without your active collaboration. And of course, thanks to FLEF, for giving uh, PCIM the opportunity uh, to hold this summit because uh, we want more and more conversations like these to happen, uh, not just on Ithaca College campus, but everywhere in the world. So with that, uh, once again, uh, thank you. And I think we can uh, close, move well, towards closing. Thank you, Raza, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Now, audience, I invite you to go to gallery view and unmute and put on your cameras perhaps, and let's have a really nice round of appreciation for these fantastic scientists and journalists who shared their evenings with us. Look in the chat, there's a little party favor for everybody. It's a PDF of all of the wonderful links and references that were made throughout. So grab that before you, you go on home. And I really hope that uh, we can see you again at some more fluff events. <laughs>